Jesus invited his disciples, come, follow me. His invitation wasn't just for when things are challenging or convenient. His calling was for each of us to follow him every moment of every day through good times and bad ones. The key to following is abiding, and abiding is remaining in constant connection with God. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. The focus here is not on the fruit, but on the abiding. When we live in unbroken communion with God, depending on Him for our lives, growth, and sustenance, an amazing thing occurs. Our lives cannot help but to bear much fruit for His glory. So come, seek Him, find Him, taste and see that the Lord is good. Good morning. I'm, I'm excited to see you all this morning. Thank you for braving the weather and the flood that's going on outside. You know, the real awesome thing is, is that it's raining outside, but it's not raining here because we had our roof fixed. Isn't that awesome? Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 1 to 7. Uh, because it's raining outside and because it's April and, you know, there's how many times does it rain on a, an, on, in April on a Sunday? Only God knows. But I have to share with you my favorite dad joke. You ready? If April showers bring May flowers, what do May flowers bring? Pilgrims. There you go. There you go. Hey, for, uh, for, the last, for the last 11 weeks, 12 weeks, we have been, as a whole church, immersed in the whole concept of the abiding life. And I hope that through your small group and through the time we've had here, and if you, those of you that grow groups, that this has really been a great time to help you to grow in your understanding and to put these spiritual disciplines in place. These spiritual disciplines are essential to abiding. God gave them to us. He, he, he said, here is how you abide. Do these things. And each one, whether it's worship or prayer or fasting or scripture memory, whatever it is, it all serves a purpose to help us to abide. And so today we're going to close out with what I believe is maybe the most important aspect of the abiding life. And we'll get to that in a second. C.S. Lewis wrote, Christians exist for nothing else but to draw men to Christ and to make them into little Christ. If they're not doing that, then all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, and the Bible itself are a waste of time. God became man for one purpose, to redeem people, to release them into his service. What a statement. If you remember when we started the series several weeks ago, I share with you that I fear that many of us have been taught that our church experience is all that's needed in order to follow Jesus. And I share with you that I feared that, that what's, what we've been taught over the last 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, however long you've been going to church, we've been taught something less than what's required in order to follow Jesus. See, most of us have been taught to be saved. All we have to do is accept that we're sinners, pray a prayer, say we're sorry, and we're in. And while there's a kernel of truth in that, when we look at the scriptures, what we understand is that's not the full picture. Jesus gave his life for more than us to give him a faith nod. Jesus gave his life so that we would follow him, that we would know him and follow him. And so these two ideas, they're not inseparable. In fact, what I believe is that Jesus, Jesus is, uh, because following Jesus is a call to more than just acknowledging his work on the cross, it's living 
as if you actually believe that he laid down his life on the cross. But see, what I think's happened to so many of us, we think as long as we've prayed a prayer, walked an aisle, been dipped in some water, then we're okay with God and we can live however we want to live. But the truth is, when we sign on the dotted line and we say, Jesus, I believe in you and I will follow you, what we're really saying is, I'm going to walk in your footsteps. I want to know you. I want to be like you. I want to do as you did. Why do I say that? Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, here's what Jesus said. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only, only the one who does the will of my Father. Only the one. Only people who seek to do the Father's will Meaning there's more to this thing called the Christian life than just acknowledging his existence. It is to live with a determined surrender to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to live as he lived. In the first message of this series, I shared this quote by Bishop Callisto Ware. I want to remind you of it. Christianity is more than a theory about the universe, more than teaching, teachings written down on paper. It's a path along which we journey. In the deepest and richest sense, it's the way of life. It's the way of life. What is this life? It's called the abiding life. That's what the Christian life is. It's not just getting fire insurance. It's living, walking, experiencing, and being led by God in your everyday life. It's the with God life. And as you, if we just read, it, it begins in John 15, where Jesus says to his disciples, I am the vine, you are the branches. If anyone abide in me and I in him, they will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. And so what does it mean? It means to, to abide is to have that close, non-transactional, continual relationship with Jesus that involves staying connected to him through the ministry of the Holy Spirit by living in alignment with the Holy Spirit, living under the influence of the Holy Spirit, in accordance with God's word and with God's will. And so for 11 weeks, we've been discussing all these tools that God has given us in order to help us to abide, to help us to remain in intimate connection with God so that our lives are powered by the Holy Spirit instead of by ourselves. Well, today as we close, I want to, to look at the ultimate expression of a Jesus follower. And that is fulfilling the Great Commission by becoming a disciple who makes disciples. When you read the Great Commission, what we see is we're to go into the world. That's our what. We are to go into the world and make disciples. That's it. And then he tells us how. He says, by baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded them. And so whether you're a pastor, whether you're a Sunday school teacher, whether you're a, a, a pew potato, whatever you want to call yourself, if you are a follower of Jesus, this is your commission. It doesn't matter what you do for a living. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter anything if you are a follower of Jesus. This is Jesus' commission to you and to me. Go into your world. Go where you live, work, and play and make disciples. And a disciple is someone who trusts and obeys. Not trust then obeys. They trust and obey. Now, I call this the ministry of alongside and I get the concept from what, G, what in John 14, 16, where Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete. The Holy Spirit is our alongsider. He walks with us. He, he lives within us. He, he, we, we, we do life with him always at our side. Here's what Jesus said. If you love me, obey me. 
And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, and he will never leave you. He's the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. And disciple-making, alongside it occurs when one maturing believer intentionally takes responsibility to walk alongside of someone else. It doesn't matter whether they're a believer or whether they're not. Think about it. When, when, when Jesus called the 12 to his side, were they believers? No. They were not believers yet. But it's walking along someone who has an openness and an appetite for God, and you walk alongside of them, and you, you take Jesus that's been planted in you, all the things that you know about God, all the things that you know are required to walk with God, and you start investing those things into someone else. It might be your children. It might be your grandchildren. It might be your next-door neighbor. It might be a friend. It might be a perfect stranger. But it's the decision to live life consciously saying, I'm going to invest all that God has invested in me into someone else to help them to walk with Jesus, to know him and walk with him. Now, there's actually two ways in Scripture that we see that we alongside. The first I call reactive alongsiding. Jesus modeled this when he would engage crowds. He also modeled this when he would meet with someone one-on-one, -on -one, whether it was the woman at the well or whether it was uh, the woman caught in adultery or whether it was the man that was born blind. He would engage in these moments, these short-term encounters where he would minister to people in order to reveal to them who he was. In the same way, when we encounter people, it might be for five minutes, it might be for five hours, but we, we have a short-term event in which we come and we minister to them in Jesus' name in order to point them to Jesus. This is, we're reacting to the opportunity, and I'll give you a perfect example of this. This last week, I was with one of my grow groups at the Chick, and we were, were just starting ready to meet. And this man, he, he had to be in his 80s, comes walking up to us. And he pulls out his phone. He says, would you pray for me and my wife? And he shows us a picture of his house. And there's a tree that has fallen in his house, a massive oak tree. And it took out the power lines and he had no power in his house. And he goes on to tell us that they contacted insurance, but because the insurance, because the, 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 the tree didn't hit the house, insurance won't cover it, and they live on a fixed income, and they have no means of paying to get it fixed. Well, I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, what can I do to help this guy? I'm, I, I felt helpless. And we looked at the man and said, we'd be more happy to pray for you. And then all of a sudden, I thought, you know what? We have a couple of people at our church that work for Georgia Power. I wonder if they could help him. And so I send a text out to these two guys, and I said, here's the situation. Is there anything you guys can do to help? Well, one thing led to another, and we just looked at the man. We told the man and his sweet wife that we'd pray for him, and the wife broke down crying. One thing led to another, and here's the short story. Last I heard, Georgia Power went to their house, fixed everything electrical at their house that was broken on the house as well as getting them all hooked up and the city of Atlanta came and cleaned it all up and didn't charge them a penny. Isn't that awesome? Here's the point. That's reactive alongsiding. Reactive alongsiding is simply being available to do whatever you can do in Jesus' name because you can. pretty awesome to hear. I would have loved to seen their face when they got the phone call and said, it's all going to be taken care of. I may never see them again. The guys in my group may never see them again. Reactive alongside them. That's awesome. But really God's heart is not just that we are reactive in alongside him, but that we're proactive in alongside him. Proactive alongsiding is what Jesus did with the 12. He brought a group of people together and he walked with them and he invested 
heaven into them. He met them at the point of their need. He led them. I mean, most of these guys were, they were religious, but they were lost. Some of them were probably irreligious, but he brings this group of 12 guys, and for three and a half years, he walks with them, and he puts everything he can to, into them so that when he leaves, they're ready to go and do what he called them to do. And we're here today because those 11 guys, which I always take stock in the fact that Jesus was 11 for 12, okay? Because it's not a perfect process. But what we're doing is it, it requires a higher degree of relational engagement. It requires effort. It requires spending concentrated time encouraging each other, dialoguing over truth, and the most important, doing life together. Opening up your heart to let someone else in as they open up their heart to let you in. And this is so much more, so much more than attending a church worship service. It's so much more than being in a Bible study or even a life group. It's a relational investment of yourself into someone else. See, church services and Bible studies and life groups, they support the disciple-making process, but they don't make disciples. Why? Because disciples are not made by programs. Disciples are made by people. It's a process. It's a life-to-life endeavor where we're willing to get our hands dirty by, by sticking them into the, 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 the souls of other men and women. And that's messy. It's really messy. Do you know why it's messy? Because we live in a sinful, fallen world, and it makes life a mess. But when you start walking with people and doing life with them, that's when this iron sharpens iron begins to take place. Let me say it to you this way. Discipling is done by someone, not something. It's done by persons, not programs. It's achieved by individuals, not institutions. It occurs when one maturing believer pours themselves and invests their life into another soul who's open to receiving and following Jesus. Here's the way Paul wrote in Ephesians 4. God wants us to grow up, to know the whole truth, and to tell it in love, like Christ in everything. And so with that in mind, I want to take the remaining time that I have this morning, and I want to share with you where the Apostle Paul challenged his protege, Timothy, in this whole concept of being a disciple who makes disciples. And he gives him four pictures or four portraits, four metaphors to help us to understand what a disciple is. And so with that in mind, the introduction's over. I want everybody to stand, and we're going to read this word together. He starts out, you, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to reliable men who will be qualified to teach others also. Endure hardship like a good soldier of Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, Anyone who competes as an athlete doesn't receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Father, I pray you bless the reading of your word. I pray you would give us clarity and understanding. Speak to us today about your calling on our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, be seated. So in this passage, we get four, four portraits, four pictures. We get the picture of a mentor or teacher. We get the picture of a soldier, the picture of an athlete, and the picture of a farmer. And each one of these give us some insight into what it means to be a disciple who makes disciples. But it all begins with a commission to entrust Jesus in me, Jesus in you, into the life of another person. It, it speaks to the fact that it's life to life. The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, there's that first connection. These entrust to reliable men. 
See, Paul was inviting Timothy, he's inviting us to do what Jesus had done with the 12, which was take a group of people on a journey of discovery to who he is and what he wanted them to become. And that thing that's intriguing to me is that Jesus met them right where they were. It didn't matter whether they were believers or not. It's a, it's a, it is a false idea that discipleship begins after salvation. Discipleship begins when you're willing to do life with someone else and to pour Jesus in you into them, whether they are believers or not. Whether they're believers or not. See, what Paul was inviting Timothy and inviting us to do is he, he said, won't you join me in a perpetual generational regeneration? In other words, be a mentor to mentors who will then pay it forward and mentor someone else. And the key is entrusting yourself into reliable men. Now, the word entrust is a banking term in the Greco-Roman world. It simply meant to deposit something of value into someone, into an, into an account for safekeeping. In this case, we're taking the priceless gift of the grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, and we're depositing this truth into another soul for safekeeping. That's what he's asking us to do. But notice the gift is to be invested into the lives of reliable people. A reliable person, that that word is maybe not the best translation. What I would say is, is someone who has an openness to the things of God. So if you run if you run into someone who's an atheist and they're ready to they're they're ready to beat you half to death, that's not that's I would not consider that person a reliable person. But if you go to someone, they say, you know what, I'm open to talking to you about spiritual things. That would be the type of person you say, well, then let's talk about spiritual things. So you're looking for people who have an openness, an appetite, and then you begin to deposit all that you know about God into them. And it's incremental. We'll learn that on the, on, the, on the last picture. It's not something you just don't go and say, here's everything I know about Jesus, good luck. That's not what he's saying. But rather, it's someone who will mentor, teach over time all that, that they know they put into someone else. So a disciple is a, is a, is a mentor. A disciple is also a soldier. This is really interesting. He says, endure hardship like a good soldier of Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Three things that I notice here. First, they fight through difficulty. They endure hardship. It means literally to fight, to never give up. No matter how much opposition you have, you keep pressing on. It's being faithful to the task even under pressure and opposition because you're committed to it because you absolutely believe in what you're doing. I think about the passage in in Ephesians chapter 6 where Paul says our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. In other words, we have opposition. And it may not, it's not just people. There are spiritual forces at work, spiritual warfare going on, doing everything that the demonic can do to kill, steal, and destroy. And so if you think that there's not an enemy out there, if you don't think the enemy came to church today to distract you, to get you to, to, to not pay attention, to get you to go, well, I've heard that before, to, to cash out, then you're sadly mistaken. The enemy is alive and well, and he goes to church, and he comes to your house, and he goes to your business, and he gets in your business every day to kill, steal, and destroy. And so we've got to have this conviction that I'm going to fight through. And so a disciple realizes that they're in a war. That they're in a battle. It's not, the Christian life is not a walk in the park. They understand that, that when they get up in the morning, they're going to get good on a battleship, not a cruise ship. Because they're at war. And what's at, what's at stake is everyone's soul. We're in a battle. We fight through difficulty. They also, it says that they focus on the mission. Paul says that a soldier doesn't get entangled in civilian affairs. 
They're not distracted by the things that don't matter. They're focused on the mission, and they remain focused on the mission. The word entangled just simply means to get caught up or to, tri or to be tripped up. The actual picture is of a soldier who's trying to get his sword out, but it gets stuck in his cloak, and he can't fight. And so he says, they don't, they don't get entangled. I, was, I never served in the military, but I've sat down and I've had many, many conversations with men and women who have been in the military. And here's what I've understood. As an ordinary citizen, I often miss, or we often miss, this whole concept of mission because we live life as free agents. We live life making our own decisions, involving ourselves in whatever extracurricular activities we want to do, we don't take orders from anyone except men from their, from their wives and their honey-do list. A soldier, though, he doesn't have that option. Otherwise, he's AWOL. A soldier, he has to take that order that's been given to him, and he has to go do it. And see, as a disciple, as a soldier of Christ, when we get our commission, we should live determined to do it in order to honor our, our commanding officer. And so uh, what a soldier is, he avoids anything that would prevent him from being focused on his calling or his mission or his duty. I mean, can you imagine a soldier Having going up to his, his commanding officer, his commanding officer comes up to him and says, hey, I want you to do this. And the, he says, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I, I, I got this TV show that I really like watching on Thursday nights, and that would just conflict with it. I wouldn't be able to watch that TV show. Or, you know what, my kid's got a soccer event or a baseball event. Or, or you know, I can't do that because I, I can't go to battle this week because I'm going on vacation. No, they're focused on the mission. And they understand that when they're told to do something, they have to do it. Have you ever thought about the fact that as a soldier of Christ, he has says, you, you. Everybody take your finger out. Point yourself. You, go into the world and make disciples. That is a command by our commanding officer. That's what you and I have been called to do. And so the, 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 we, we fight through the hardship. We, the second thing we do is we focus on the mission. Third, we follow our leader. I love this phrase, pleasing him. One of my favorite phrases in the Bible, I discovered it maybe 15, 20 years ago as I was doing my own quiet time. When it says to please him, it means to put a smile on God's face. Isn't that an incredible visual? I'm seeking to follow him. See, to please God in such a manner requires that we live each day in a manner that's considered worthy of and for God by following his leading and obeying his word, and obeying his will. Ultimately, though, I think when you look at this picture of the soldier, here's what I think that is important. If we approach the Christian life casually, we will become a spiritual casualty. If we approach the Christian life casually, you will become a spiritual casualty. The third picture he gives us is an athlete. He says, anyone who competes as an athlete, athlete doesn't receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. As a former competitive athlete, I understand this. In fact, this is the one picture. I, I don't understand all the military soldier stuff, but I understand this. I understand what's required to be a successful athlete. I understand what you have to do when nobody else is watching I understand the internal, the internal drive, the discipline, the determination, and all these things apply here. See, to have spiritual drive means that you have a great internal motivation for God to win at this thing called the Christian life. I, I'm just curious, how many, this, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you want to win today your Christian life? 
How many, are, how many are just happy to be there? How many of you are just hoping to cross the finish line? The actual scripture teaches, Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians that there should be this drive, not just to finish, but to win. Listen to what Paul wrote. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Listen to this. Run in such a way as to win the prize. Don't just finish. Seek to win. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will last, that will not last. We do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, do not like run, do not run like someone aim, excuse me, do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Drive, having this internal drive. I want to win my Christian life today. The race I'm running today. And that requires discipline. Discipline refers to doing what's necessary. If you're a disciplined athlete, you're going to eat right, you're going to sleep right, you're going to exercise correctly. You're doing everything you can to get prepared for the real competition. In other words, it's what you're doing when no one else is watching so that you can, so at your peak, you can be your best at your peak when everyone is watching. I'll never forget this. The Masters just occurred. Uh, one day I was playing golf up at, up at, at Sugarloaf up in North Atlanta. And uh, a professional golfer was there. And he was getting ready for the Masters. And the guys in my group knew this guy. And so we walked over to him. They were talking to him. They said, what are you doing? He says, oh, I'm out here just, just getting ready for the Masters. He stood there for four hours. There's no telling how many balls he hit, hitting the same shot that he knew he was going to have to hit at the Masters. Four hours hitting one shot when nobody else was watching. That's what's required in the Christian life. When no one else is watching, we have to put in the effort we have to be in God's word. We have to pray. We have to fast. We have to go to church and be a part of a, of, of a koinonia fellowship. All these spiritual disciplines, this is what we're doing when no one else is watching so that when the game time comes, we're ready to win. You're not going to win in your Christian life if you're not practicing your Christian life in private when no one else is watching. That's why quiet times are so important. That's why personal worship times are so important. Listen to what Paul said to Timothy. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Here's the point. If you want to win at the Christian life, you have to be determined to put in the spiritual effort each and every day when no one is watching because it doesn't just happen. You have to build spiritual muscle. You have to build spiritual stamina so that when the time comes for you to compete, you can win. And then one last one. The disciple is a farmer. He says the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. I think this is interesting. In, comparison, in comparing disciple making to the hardworking farmer, Paul says that he, he, it requires fortitude, it requires patience, it requires time, it requires conviction to wait for the harvest. In other words, disciple making doesn't occur quickly and overnight. It happens over time through intentionality. For you to give your life to someone else, to, to invest Jesus in them, it requires time. You plant, you sow, you do all these different things. In fact, what we see in this, this word here is that it requires, uh, it requires being deliberate and requires being diligent. What does a farmer do? 
He starts early, he stays late, and he works until the job is done. One commentator said it this way, it requires prepping the soil, plowing the field, planting the seed, providing the nourishment, pruning the unnecessary, protecting from pests pest, pest and weeds, and ultimately participating in the harvest. Arkett Hughes in his, in his commentary says, he sums up the farmer and he says, a farmer is, has early and long hours because he can't afford to lose time. What would happen if we thought about ministry and great commission in that we don't have time to lose time? Constant toil to plow, sow, tend, weed, reap, and store as also you prepare for regular disappointments from frost, pest, and disease. But ultimately, it requires much patience as everything happens slowly. Any of you like to garden? My, my idea of garden, gardening is buying a plant that's fully mature and stick it in the ground. But that's not gardening. Gardening is planting the seed and watching it grow protecting it till it comes to a harvest. That's what disciple making is. And so here's the point. Farm, disciple making, like farming, will have its ups and downs. Sometimes the harvest will be plentiful. At times it'll be scarce because we're not in control of the harvest. We're only in control of living a life that plants a seed. We're only, we're only responsible for what we can do. And so the key to success is not measuring fruitfulness, it's measuring faithfulness. And I shared this story a couple of years ago, I'm going to share it again, because I think it's so applicable here. There was once a missionary named John Williams who served in the New Hebrides Islands, and he was speaking at this missionary conference in Edinburgh, and he was telling about all of these incredible things that had happened. And the people were just spellbound hearing him tell about how all these people that were unreached people group were coming to Christ and they had given them the Bible and they're like clapping, uh, uh, clapping their hands and just, this is awesome. And when he gets finished, this other missionary stands up, this small man who gets up and he's, and he, and he, he, he's kind of trembling. He, you can tell that he's a little out of his element. And he says, well, friends, we haven't seen the remarkable success that Mr. Williams has, has experienced. Yet we have still labored in a far off land for many years with only small results. But then he turned, he says, but I have this comfort and you should too. For when the master comes to reckon with his servants, he won't say, well done, good and successful servant. He's gonna say, well done, good and faithful. When I read this text, what I see Paul challenging us is to be faithful to the task of making disciples where we live, work, and play. Taking the Jesus that we have in us and finding someone who will allow us to walk alongside of them to invest this Jesus into them. That's what Jesus is asking you to do. He's asking you to live on mission where you live, work, and play. Amen? Father, thank you for the calling. And Lord, I thank you for the last several weeks. And Lord, I pray for each one of us today that as we're sitting here, that Lord, we would ask those questions. Am I truly abiding? Am I living out those spiritual disciplines to help me to abide? And Father, ultimately, most importantly, am I giving away to others what you're pouring into me? I want everybody's head bowed and eyes closed. I don't want anybody looking around. I'm not even going to be looking around. But after these last 12 weeks, if you would say, Lord, I really want to abide in you. And I commit today 
to putting into practice these spiritual activities you have given us to help us to abide with the ultimate desire that you would use my life, whether it's with my spouse, my children, my grandchildren, my neighbor, that you would allow me to walk alongside of someone else to pour what you have poured into me into them. If that's you, and you'll say, Lord, I accept this, I want you just simply to slip up your hand to heaven and say, Lord, I accept this calling. Lord, you see every hand. Lord, I pray for each one of us that, Lord, that you would truly take our commitment. And, Father, you'll give us opportunity to pour Jesus in us into someone else as we abide in you. And I thank you for this in Jesus' name. And everybody said.